Section six of Movies and Hollywood Short Story Collection, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Moyer. Alarums and Excursions by George Hibbard. When I started out on my regular daily tramp, in short skirt and stout boots, I little thought that, to be sure, an afternoon walk in Clovertop was not without excitement. I could stop at the post office to see if there was a letter, which there never was. I could buy some needles or thread, which I did not want. Passing through the village street, I might pause to ask the exact state of Mrs. Dodd's rheumatism. Out on the country road the possibilities of adventure were not exhausted. What if Farmer Toppin's cross dog were loose? I might even come on a cow in the way. In the spring I could look for the first hepatica and the first robin. In the fall to watch for the more brilliantly stained leaves to bear back with one was an occupation. Still, the quest for vernal buds or the collection of autumnal foliage did not quite satisfy the longings of a soul panting for life and emotions. My researches in the volumes of the Clovertop Library told me that there was something else, places where something was doing. I knew that there was a great world beyond, where girls ran into danger and were run away with where there were hair-breadth escapes and hair-brained rescues. I wanted to be thrilled, but the lateness of the afternoon train as I crossed the railroad track was the only agitating question to present itself. I was searching for trouble, seas of it, in which to battle, and I only got mud puddles. I longed for alarums and excursions, and there was nothing to which I could look forward, except tennis and Sunday school picnics. Our grandmothers might have been content to take care of the canary. Everything was not brought under a girl's nose in those times. She was not able to read and hear constantly of what was going on about her, what was happening to other girls where things did happen, as for myself, I wanted to eat the canary. I wished to kick over the traces. With my limited opportunities, one might conclude that my demands would have been small. Not in the least. I was determined to have the most and the best, and after due reflection I concluded that I could only find my ideal in a war correspondent. That was the only sufficiently picturesque character which the present day had to offer. I had read of McGann's adventures in the Kirilkum Desert. I remembered Archibald Forbes' wonderful night ride in the Zululand. I knew of the exploits of the later heroes. The doings of a certain James Doyers interested me particularly. I had followed him by his letters all over the world. I read eagerly everything he had written. Some of his descriptions I knew by heart. Where was I to find anything of the like in Clovertop? I was wasting my life. I was twenty-one, and any girl ought to be able to have something to remember or forget by that time. I set out that afternoon in a particularly despondent frame of mind. The sky and air had something to do with it. The one was so bright and cheerful, the other so free and exhilarating. The most perfect of autumn mornings had mellowed into the most delicious of autumn afternoons. There was magic in the hour, in the soft blue mists, beyond which I might imagine anything, in the charmed silence, unbroken, by any marring everyday sound. I felt myself in an enchanted world. I moved as if under a spell. 
Part Two. I had strayed from the beaten road. A path led through Dinsmore's woods. That way home was longer, but I took it. I wandered on, idly watching a squirrel skipping from bough to bough before me. Then I stopped short. I fairly jumped. I could not believe my eyes. Here in Clovertop, on the edge of Preble's Hill, where every foot of ground was familiar to me and where I knew every one, I stood stock still and gazed. I held my breath from sheer astonishment. A ghost at night could not have startled me more than this apparition in the soft daylight. There, just in front of the clump of trees, was the figure. I peered and peered again, no mistaking it. I could distinguish clearly the small, alert shape in the dark brown uniform. I could make out the smart cap. I could observe the linen gaiters. In the hands was a compact, venomous-looking rifle. Banzai! There before me, in fighting trim, stood a soldier of Japan. I could not be mistaken. I had just been reading, with quickened pulse, an account of a battle in which Oyama's men were engaged. There, surely, undoubtedly, unquestionably, was one of them. Had I stepped on a magic carpet? Was I bewitched? Had I gone back three years? Was I in Mayfield County or in Manchuria? I could not trust my senses. Nothing more amazing could have happened. Still, the presence of a single soldier might be explained. How account, though, for what next caught my eyes? Looking closely, I saw that there were other Japanese soldiers in the grove, that it was swarming with them. Most of them were resting at ease. From time to time one moved, and the action seemed to force conviction upon me. With halting steps, as if fascinated, unbelieving and unable not to believe, I moved slowly forward. A moment's advance brought me to a new point of view. What was that? I almost screamed I was so startled. On a hill I saw a field gun with its limber a short way off. It was surrounded by a squad of figures just like those that first attracted my attention. Japanese artillery on Harmon's Hill, where on winter afternoons the school children coasted. Incredible, marvelous, inconceivable. I noted the heavy wheels, the dull gleam of the metal of the tube-like barrels, no mistaking it, and there were more guns, not one but a battery, more and more wonderful, more and more prodigious. All doubt was gone, all skepticism had vanished. I was forced to accept what I saw, and being unable to reach any explanation, I was content to do without one. A shot! Hitherto complete silence had reigned. The report came from behind me, and I turned swiftly. If I had been amazed before, I was utterly overcome by the spectacle I now beheld. What were those tall, heavy, long-coated, long-haired, long-bearded creatures? No figments of a dream. They were too solid and substantial for that. On a bit of rising ground stood, yes, no, yes. THE BATTALIONS OF RUSSIA. As I watched, an officer waved his sword vigorously and cried hoarsely. Running my eye over the country, I detected other companies of men clad in the same way and more guns. Only with these latter, the artillerymen had the dress of the bear, while the others wore the raiment of the sun. I hardly breathed. Alone I stood between the lines of Japanese and Russian forces drawn up in battle array. How this had come about, I did not inquire. The situation was too thrilling, too critical to permit reflection. I only knew I was there. My mind was busy with what might happen next. At the edge of the yellow woods I heard the crack of a rifle. I turned back. Instantly another rang out, then 
another and another twenty a hundred a thousand as i fancied with an angry splutter the firing began as a murderous rattle it went on in swelling tumult it continued hark i heard a deeper note the gun from the hill held by the men of nippon had spoken bang went another the diapason deepened the heavier explosion dulled for a moment the crackle of the musketry fire which however seemed to burst forth again more briskly the din increased the russian guns were answering now along the skyline of the hill i could see the figures clearly defined the men were working frantically loading and firing the closer rattle of rifles caused me to veer about i found the small brown figures scattered down the hill an irregular line of them was now climbing the gentle slope now crossing the small brook a number of little japanese flags appeared here and there each rose fell zigzagged and kept on i knew what was happening the japanese were coming up for an attack the skirmishers were thrown forward and were leading the way and i i lingered there between the contending armies directly in the line of fire squarely in the path of the immediate onslaught i had been too amazed to be terrified before but now i felt a terrible fear my knees trembled and i ran and dropped down behind a large rock there i cowered i could distinguish the rushing sound of the onset of the attackers the breaking of bodies through the underbrush the occasional noise of a fall i heard muttered exclamations but strangely enough no shouts no cheers such as i thought must arise from a charging column those pressing up the slope were firing as they came those defending kept up a steady fusillade the roar was incessant i knew now that the storming party was nearing me the first of the soldiers emerged from a clump of bushes and ran through the long grass suddenly the men were all about me toiling on as one passed the rock he dropped i could not doubt that he had been hit as i saw him fall as i beheld him lying there my heart stood still was he dead or only wounded what could i do could i not do something the incident was so unexpected the experience so unprecedented that i could not gather my wits together i could only follow my instinct in a moment i had darted out and was kneeling at his side oh are you hurt i cried can i help you the man rolled over and gazed at me i believe with quite as much wonderment as he had inspired in me i had spoken without reflection but i now remembered that he could not understand me that he could not possibly make me understand him holy moses he said with a decided irish accent it's all in the day's work i started up i was so taken aback of course i knew that the japanese often spoke english and that many of them had been educated in this country but the brogue i inspected the fellow more narrowly certainly he was small and dark but his eyes were straight and he did not look like a japanese he had an unquestionable hibernian countenance the thought came swiftly into my mind that he might be some soldier of fortune who was fighting under the foreign flag don't you trouble miss he went on i've got to lay here oh no no i interrupted trying vainly to recall all that i had learned of first aid to the injured where are you wounded i can do something i do not know what the fellow would have said i felt a hand on my shoulder drawing me back i screamed a little with the shock of the surprise instantly i was caught up carried swiftly away and deposited not too tenderly behind the big boulder from which i had run out 
Part Three. The seizure had been so unexpected, the movement so rapid, that I had not had the time to understand the method of my transportation until I was seated on the ground with my back against the stone. Then I lifted my eyes, blinked them wildly, and looked again. There, erect before me, was the embodiment of my dreams. There towered the ideal war correspondent, as I had seen him pictured in the magazines and illustrated papers. In close-fitted khaki he leaned over me, a glorified being. On his legs were beautiful baggy riding breeches, tapering to the tightest fit at the knees. About his ankles were regulation putties. Over one shoulder was slung a binocular, at the other side was girded a revolver. In his belt was thrust a notebook. His left hand held the conventional cigarette, which he had apparently been too excited to throw away. "'What are you doing out there?' he demanded in stern tones. "'Oh!' I exclaimed. "'I saw the poor fellow tumble. "'There were no Red Cross people about, "'and I wanted to help him. "'I might stop the flow of blood "'and bind up his wound "'until the doctor could attend to him.' "'A quick change of expression "'came in the young man's strong, sunburned face. "'The furrows of his brow relaxed. "'So did the line of his mouth. "'His eyes twinkled, "'and his lips parted a little.' If I had not believed that it was impossible, I might have fancied that he smiled. "'So you went in as a volunteer nurse under fire?' he said. "'Yes,' I answered, eagerly striving to peer round the corner of the granite block. Poor fellow!' Again the unknown put his hand on my arm and held me down. "'Don't raise your head,' he ordered, not an inch. I don't care for the danger, I answered with fine dramatic effect, when there is suffering to be relieved. The heroic was only the honest expression of my state of mind in the crisis. I've no doubt you wouldn't care for anything, he answered as he knelt beside me. But I do. You must stay hidden here. He himself arose and stood erect, though he watched me closely, ready to restrain me if I made a movement. How I admired him! His behavior was as I had imagined it should be, absolute composure under fire. He even nonchalantly took a puff at his cigarette. Not a point was missing. If I had been arranging all, I could not and should not have wished it different. My first bewilderment over, I gathered my scattered wits together and sought for an explanation of the extraordinary happenings in which I was playing a part. I could find none, and finally turned in desperation to my companion. "'I don't understand anything,' I burst forth. "'Where am I, and what is going on? I seem to have been caught up and carried to the moon, or to Manchuria. Won't you explain? He laughed again in his easy, pleasant fashion. What's the use of explanations except to spoil things? Consider that you are having an adventure. That is enough. From where I was, the view was not extensive. However, the pounding of the great guns and the banging of the smaller arms came as an attestation which seemed incontrovertible. I was surrounded by the swelling sounds of desperate warfare. I could not doubt that at that moment men were engaged in desperate hand-to-hand -hand conflict. Letting my eyes stray down over the country, I noticed that the battery which I had first beheld had ceased firing. As I watched, I saw the caissons hastily attached to the cannon. The artillerymen were bringing forward the horses. "'You won't let me get up?' I asked. "'No,' he answered energetically, and turning as if prepared to hold me in my place. 
then i declared with conviction there must be something there must be some real danger yes he answered slowly there is a certain danger i drew a long breath was i truly on the firing line was i actually in peril unless things were as they seemed to be why was i kept there in hiding but i urged if there is danger for me in standing up there must be for you no he replied curiously enough i'm not included in that peril still he continued sinking down at my side i think i might take a moment or two off duty there we rested with the peaceful autumn landscape outstretched at our feet except for his dress we might have been an ordinary young woman and an ordinary young man who had paused when out for an ordinary country walk there was little that was peaceful though except the scene for deafening explosion succeeded deafening explosion volley followed volley in our immediate neighborhood anyway let's take the goods the gods provide he entreated after this we ought to know each other better than if i had taken you in at a dozen dinners it's a little i admitted like being cast away together on a desert island i feel almost as if i might say things which could only be said naturally after a long friendship there are things you want to say to me yes i knew that i wanted so much to hear them that i was intimidated by my own eagerness you may say them i said after a pause and with a mighty effort in the first place i want to tell you that you are a trump i looked i am afraid the delight which i felt you were frightened he continued stiff i interrupted i am now and i can't understand never mind he interposed you did what you did without thought of yourself you ran out where you believed there was a chance for you to do good every one would i replied every one would not he answered decidedly every one is not a heroine and that's what you are i wish i were a hero well i replied boldly you look more like one than anybody i ever saw you mean these togs he exclaimed indicating his costume and accoutrements with a motion of his hand i feel as if i were at a masquerade you must think me silly to be dressed up in this way i i know i said with my inexperienced frankness that i can trust you you do he exclaimed eagerly drawing a little closer to me a particularly loud detonation held us both silent i'm completely at sea and in the dark but i trust you implicitly do then he exclaimed hurriedly believe what i have to say to all intents and purposes we have met under exceptional circumstances under unusual conditions formalities are abandoned i am going to take advantage of the chance to tell you what i could not tell you for a long time in everyday life i looked away from him and down and across the little valley the artillery was coming rapidly toward us the horses were splashing through the rivulet the great wheels were jolting over the stones in the intensity and excitement of listening to him i had even forgotten the battle going on so near us i watched the guns and gunners in a distant dreamlike sort of a way indeed with the strangeness of it all I seemed to have been in a daydream all of the time. I had been so long entranced that I had come to accept everything, to find the battery galloping up the hill, to be seated by this khaki-clad being had ceased to strike me as remarkable. We aren't in everyday life, 
i said dreamily where we are or what we are i don't know the field pieces were very near us i watched the men urging the animals then may i tell you he asked in low tones yes i whispered a blinding flash a deafening crash the darkness of dense smoke and i knew nothing more part four when i opened my eyes i found myself looking straight up at the bright autumn heavens then in a moment i was staring into the eyes of my strange hero i could see the expression of dismay of horror in his face are you hurt he demanded breathlessly no no i answered doubtfully i think i'm all right thank he began but he was so lost in the intensity of his gaze so busy holding on to me as it were with his eyes that he clearly forgot to finish the sentence then it is all real i gasped we were in a battle there was danger dazed as i was i could accept anything we are not here in clover top at all but this is liao yang or san tai tsi or somewhere else i went on sleepily i lifted myself up and what i saw served to justify my conclusions a shattered gun carriage was nearby a dead horse lay not far off a group of men in the japanese uniform were busy about a fallen comrade a little stream of blood trickled down the face of my war correspondent no no he exclaimed hurriedly i should have told you before i didn't want to do it though because the chance as i said was too good to lose the fighting is nothing but a fake it's all a humbug nothing you see is real of course we are not in china but in clover top but why i murmured unsteadily i still felt dull and weak this is all got up on purpose as a show everything has been arranged to be photographed to be used for the kinetoscope at the vaudeville theatres the people must have war pictures as the real thing is impossible something must be managed and in this way we give them what is more real than real at least they get an artistic and dramatic representation leaving a more vivid impression of an actual battle than anything else could then you are not really a war correspondent i am he said eagerly i am doyers james doyers of the chronicle i have been with both the japanese and russian armies that is why i am here to see that the thing is properly done for the kinetoscope company it was indeed the distinguished war correspondent himself i am glad i answered with more vigour but why did you keep me behind this rock a young woman wandering about a battlefield dressed for an afternoon walk would not exactly appear natural would not add the proper local colour to the scene there was danger of your being photographed oh i exclaimed and the man who fell one of them told off to pretend that he was hit and all this i asked pointing toward the wreckage this is true and honest enough i had no idea anything could happen he hurried on the blank cartridges in one of the tumbrils exploded as those guns were passing to take up a new position you are hurt i said suddenly rising to my knees he passed his hand across his brow a splinter has drawn a little blood he replied and the man over there how is he said my companion addressing one who stood near all right sir came the answer only badly scared you see he explained all is well i listened silence had fallen the battle is over 
I said. Yes, the show is finished. It's time to go home, I continued rather sadly. Yes, he replied with manifest dejection. You, I had to say it, his air was so melancholy. You were going to tell me something just before that thing went off. I was going to tell you, he began, turning quickly, with his face lighting up, that you are the best and the prettiest and the sweetest. Oh, I exclaimed, we are not in Manchuria now. No, he replied, again cast down. But I want to hear, he took a step toward me. Again, I could not restrain myself. I want to hear about the real battles and campaigns, I said, and I know that Mama would be very glad to have you come in to tea. End of section six.